QPOs and so on. So it is pretty clear that if you want to make a model for, the, uh, for all these phenomena, <coughs> one needs to have a formalism for describing uh, superfluid hydrodynamics, but also one needs to have uh, some uh, suitable microscopic inputs for that. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> probably one of the most striking consequences of superfluidity uh, is the possibility of having uh, uh, the coexistence of uh, different superfluids within, uh, within the superfluid. <coughs> it is well known in the case of the superfluid helium that many properties can be explained uh, by a two-fluid uh, two model. In particular, <coughs> in the case of uh, superfluid helium, uh, one effect which is uh, very important is uh, entrainment. So what this means is that in general the momentum and the velocity of each atom are not aligned. So, uh, so and in the case of superfluid helium, one can even calculate uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, effective masses here uh, experimentally. <coughs> now, uh, the same kind of phenomena also uh, occur in uh, superfluid mixtures, and, and even uh, in the case where there is a zero temperature. And in this case, uh, it was studied uh, for the first time by Andre van Baskin in mixtures of superfluid helium-3 and superfluid uh, helium-4. Now, <coughs> the question is, uh, in neutron stars, we know that there should be uh, some superfluids. So one should uh, be careful about this entrainment effect and uh, not simply skip it. So <coughs> the question now is, how many fluids should we consider in, uh, in a neutron star? So the usual argument uh, is to say, well, okay, uh, neutrons uh, are uncharged, electrically uncharged. So basically, if they are superfluid, they can move with a different velocity uh, compared to uh, everything else. So at least in the simplest uh, possible model, one should consider two components, superfluid neutrons and essentially uh, everything else. So here, protons means really everything else. Now, <coughs> this is really the simplest uh, situation. If we go to finite temperature, then one should add one more fluid, like in superfluid helium at finite temperature. And uh, if there are other components like uh, hyperons or some other funny phases, uh, so one should add more fluids uh, in this list. So, so I will only consider this, uh, the simple, uh, this simple two-fluid model. This is a kind of canonical picture, but one should keep in mind that in reality, this could be much more complicated. So, <coughs> we have heard uh, last week how to describe this kind of uh, uh, superfluid mixture, and so I will not go again through all this, uh, these details. The only uh, things to remember is from this formalism, what one needs is uh, the expression of some master function or simply Lagrangian density of uh, this fluid system. Once we know this quantity, then one can obtain uh, flow equations and essentially everything. So, <coughs> so now, <coughs> if we take this simple two-fluid model uh, in, uh, in non-relativistic superfluids, and I will discuss relativistic superfluids later, uh, this looks like this. So the Lagrangian is just kinetic term minus some potential uh, energy. So in the case of just one fluid, we just <coughs> skip this part. And this is the usual internal energy density. So this is what uh, people are calling equation of state. Also, this is a usual uh, equation of state. Now, when one allows for fluids to move with different velocities, one gets uh, an extra piece. Of course, here we assume uh, uh, that the current, that the relative velocities are small, but in general, one could consider more complicated forms, quadratic, and so on, uh, and so on terms. So what is new here is that there is some uh, extra quantity here, which depends uh, on the densities, and which uh, has to be calculated, uh, of course, consistently with this, uh, uh, with, this, uh, with this energy density. Now, how does uh, entrainment appear? Uh, well, we can just use the full machinery that was discussed <coughs> Uh, last week by Greg Comer. 
And <coughs> we can calculate, for instance, uh, the momentum of neutrons and protons. And what we find is that in general there is uh, an effective mass here which appears and which directly depends on this, uh, on this new function here. So the question now is, uh, what can we say about this, uh, this coefficient? Well, there is a few uh, interesting limits. If we take uh, the case of uh, non-interacting uh, <coughs> Fermi gases, then this coefficient is simply equals to zero. So there is no, uh, there is no entrainment. Now, in general, for interacting Fermi liquid, this quantity is positive, and this quantity uh, increases with density. But this, this function can, it cannot increase indefinitely because otherwise the system could become uh, unstable. And it is actually easy to show that there is uh, an upper bound uh, given by this. So we can uh, equivalently translate this, uh, this upper bound uh, in terms of these uh, effective masses. And so one can see from this simple, uh, from this simple con constraint that the neutron effective mass is actually very close to one, simply because the proton fraction is typically very small uh, in a neutron star, so just a few percent. So this neutron effective mass will be in general very close to one. Now the proton effective mass is, uh, uh, is uh, at to be a greater than just the proton fraction, so this effective mass could be very small. <coughs> so, uh, and this, uh, so and this effective mass is here, uh, they, they have nothing to do with, uh, with the usual microscopic effective mass that we can find in the literature. This is really uh, a, dynamical, uh, a dynamical quantity. So, so there is no contradiction between uh, this effective mass and uh, what you can find in the literature about uh, many body calculations. This is really a different quantity. What do you mean by absolute stability here? What catastrophe occurs? Well, uh, what happens is that in this case, uh, the systems, um, the ground state of the systems correspond to the case of infinite velocities. So the kinetic part of the energy uh, diverges. So. It doesn't have, I mean, you could also cure it by putting in higher order terms. By Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is within. Yeah. So, so here, this is within this. Doesn't this exclude approximation. the possibility that there are yes, yes, equilibrium yes. states with counter counter flow? Yes. 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 yes, 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 yes. So this is within this uh, this model. So if one adds uh, different Lagrangian, so then it's, uh, the boundary would change, but still there will be some some upper bound here. <coughs> so now. <coughs> Uh, so in my title, there was uh, this will generalize the equation of state, and so <coughs> usually for single fluid models, one just uh, uh, needs to know the the, f the pressure or the function of the density. <coughs> in the case of multi-fluid systems, the pressure itself can depend also uh, on the velocities, and in this uh, in the simplest case of only two fluids, uh, then the pressure is given just by the usual pressure, let's say, and some uh, extra piece, which uh, depends on this, uh, on this function, uh, on this function alpha. Uh, so now, <coughs> this function alpha has been calculated uh, uh, for now using uh, mean, field, uh, mean field model, so in this, in this paper uh, here, uh, and taking as a composition, uh, standard compositions of neutron protons uh, and leptons. So here are some uh, here are the results for uh, one calculation uh, using this this force for which there is uh, already uh, tabulated equation of state. And <coughs> so you can see here, as I said, be what I said before, that this is a neutron effective mass versus density and proton <coughs> effective mass. So the neutron effective mass is very close to one. <coughs> While uh, the proton effective mass can be uh, can be much smaller. Now the, the, the precise values of all these effective mass uh, depends, uh, of course, on which model uh, one is using. So I think there is um, there is some interesting uh, maybe connection to draw between uh, this problem and similar problem in nuclear physics uh, to put constraints on um, microscopic models for calculating these uh, these quantities.
But I guess the, these things are related to Lindau parameters. Yes, 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 so, yes. So I mean, we don't even have to go to a fully microscopic model. Well, yes, yes. Uh, we we use, yes, yes. Well, so one is able to, to calculate one of the parameters, so still one needs to make some microscopic calculations to calculate this, this one of the parameters. <coughs> <coughs> now, <coughs> if we go to relativistic superfluids, basically we can do, uh, play the same game. In this case, uh, so uh, the Lagrange density looks like this, uh, where lambda zero is basically uh, uh, corresponds to the internal energy density. And when we allow for uh, multi-fluid uh, flows, one gets extra fees. So again, this is. Uh, just the lowest order term. So one can consider much more complicated Lagrangian, adding more and more terms. But here, well, just considering the, uh, the simplest things. And this is some things that one can do because usually relative flows are, uh, are very small. <coughs> uh, and so <coughs> the, these two quantities are actually related to the quantities I showed before. So lambda zero, as I said, is. Uh, is the opposite of the internal energy, so this is a usual equation of state, let's say. And this lambda one parameter is uh, related to, the, to this function alpha. So one can go back and forth between this relativistic superfluid or non-relativistic using this, just this simple, uh, simple prescription. Now, <coughs> a funny thing about this uh, relativistic superfluids is that actually uh, the effective masses, in this case, uh, are larger, and this is uh, this is actually easy to understand, simply because in relativity all forms of energy contribute to the mass. So, uh, so that's why, for instance, for neutrons, one gets an effective mass which is actually larger than the bare mass. So, <coughs> and here there is an increase at the high densities because um, then the internal energy uh, makes uh, a strong contribution. Now. <coughs> I think there are some interesting issues uh, in this uh, multi-fluid uh, business. For instance, about uh, the composition uh, of neutron star matter. We know from, from chemistry that uh, when the system has reached an equilibrium, uh, <coughs> this corresponds to the case where uh, essentially no particles can be transformed to one another. And uh, the way to uh, to compute this is to simply to, to say that this quantity uh, is equals to zero, where, where this, uh, this epsilon is the energy per particle, and here is the, simply the number of uh, particles that are created and destroyed during the reaction. So if a neutron is, de is destroyed, this is minus one. If uh, it's a proton is created, this will be plus one, and so on. Now, if all particles are co-moving, then it's, it's uh, rather obvious which uh, how to define this energy per particle? You just take the chemical potential, and then we find the usual, uh, the usual expressions. But now, if uh, the particles are moving with different velocities, then it needs, it needs not really clear what kind of, uh, which west, which frame should we use? How to define, uh, how to define uh, this energy per particle? So I think there is some, uh, some interesting uh, work to do in this, uh, in this direction. But that depends on the boundary conditions you impose, right? I mean, what, what, uh, what, what, you, what sort of flows do you want, what you're going to hold constant? Oh, yes, right. Well, right. And so, so once you've done that, you can presumably work it yes, out. But, uh, yeah, that's true. But I think from uh, a priori, it's not obvious which framework one will use. So one has to no, but I say it depends on the physical situation you're trying to think about. What, Oh, yes, probably. So, I mean, this is my point. My point is that there is no clear-cut definition of this epsilon in general. For moving fluid, it's uh, it's rather obvious that it's just one frame, obvious frame. So, when fluids are are not moving, then which frame should we use? So well, it's, it's it just a question of what you want to, what conservation laws you want to keep happy. Uh, I'm not sure this is. Because we have chemical reactions, but the question is in which frame they will be equilibrated, something like this. And so well, I guess they would try to grind to a hole, uh, or uh, in, in the center of mass frame. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is nothing full, this is probably a so couple of problems. equilibrium will be when there is no velocity. Uh, everything will be moving. Mm. Or no, 
not necessary. No, necessarily. So, uh, there can still be some different sort of flow. Uh, so. Because the system, I mean, there is also uh, the electric particles are coupled with the magnetosphere and they are losing energy, but if neutrons, for instance, are superfluid, they are only weakly coupled. So, uh, so there can be a stationary state where there is a finite uh, uh, differential flow. So in this case, it's not clear about these uh, chemical reactions, how they proceed. So, so well, at least to me, it's not clear. But what do you think people do this in real chemistry? Well, in well, usual, sure this situation doesn't happen. Sorry? They don't get into superfluid. <laughs> no, no, but you can have you can have mixtures, for example. Yeah, but I mean, but yeah, how but do you keep, no keep things mixture. moving with yes. respect to each other? Yeah. Well, like you can, not on a long time scale. You can't do that, but maybe on a short enough time scale that you have to worry about. Things. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess then the question is how fast is momentum transfer from pair? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I I don't know. I just there's yeah, just I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe this has been studied in history, but I don't know. So I think it's actually an interesting issue, but. This has been overlooked, so this is just my point. Um, of course, we've learned also last week that uh, one should uh, uh, rather. This mixtures of superfluid helium 4 and helium 3, uh, this problem does not appear there. Of uh, equilibrium? Chemical yeah. equilibrium? No, about yeah. how, how to introduce this description. Okay. If you have both. Well, Mixture of superfluid helium form mm. helium three, which is quite possible uh, to explain it with, with some motion, and mm. uh, it should be the same problem. Yeah? But there is no reaction. Oh, yeah. case. No reaction. Yeah. Yeah. The question is uh, mm -hmm. to have some differential flow and some reactions oh, transforming particles into each other. Mm -hmm. It's not clear. At least to me, it's not clear. Uh, so another thing I think is it's about the magnetic field. So last week uh, Jose told us that one should not forget about magnetic fields. Uh, so uh, actually the principle is it's uh, very easy to include magnetic field in, in the formalism. But I think what is not so easy is to uh, combine magnetic fields and with the conditions for superconductivity. And for, I think. Uh, uh, Niels and Costas have been working on this on this problem, and so. Yeah, we got three answers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not this is interesting problem, which is not very clear. Uh, I think there is also another issue uh, related to uh, to both these <coughs> um, these entrainment effects uh, have also an impact on, on vortices. So, for instance, they uh, they change the distribution of vortices and it's also well known that due to these entrainments each neutron vortex line carry a magnetic flux. Now the question is uh, how do vortices uh, modify entrainment? So entrainment has an effect on vortices but how vortices change entrainment? This is uh, I think an interesting problem which has not been uh, solved for now. Uh, okay so how about <coughs> how about neutron star crust? We know that there, are, there, there is a superfluid in there, at least in some density range. And uh, so one also expects to have some entrainment effects uh, in the crust. So, and in this case, uh, actually, uh, these entrainment effects are well known in solid state physics, but people are not speaking about the same, uh, not speaking about entrainment, but about effective masses. And the origin is simply that each electron can be scattered by all <coughs> ions, and the end result is, uh, uh, is uh, an, effective, uh, an effective mass. Uh, so <coughs> the way to calculate this effective mass is, uh, uh, is to use uh, the same techniques that people use in solid state physics, uh, namely the band theory uh, of solids. And this is important because uh, uh, what this theory uh, uh, does is uh, providing a general framework for describing consistently clusters and, uh, and, uh, and free neutrons. So, so I'm not going into the details of this, just to some results. Uh, so here are some results of this uh, neutron uh, effective mass as a function of, uh, of density. And <coughs> the, the main feature is uh, always some kind of bell shape. And the reason is actually 
uh, weather simple. At very low densities, we do not expect to find any uh, entrainment simply because in, uh, in the case of a very dilute uh, neutron gas, their Fermi wavelength is much larger than uh, the size of the clusters, so essentially they don't see them. And uh, also at very high densities, entrainments are, are weak because in this case the matter becomes essentially homogeneous and uh, the origin of entrainment is not due to the scattering of clusters but between particles themselves, which is much weaker. So, uh, so the strongest effects uh, occur uh, around these densities. So you see that's about a factor of 10 increase in the effective mass. And in these layers, essentially, the interparticle spacing is, uh, is more or less equal uh, to the lattice spacing. So this is why these effects are... Yeah. Now you're talking about neutron effective mass. I mean, this is now the quasi-particle effective mass. No, no, no. This is just... This is... Uh, Earlier you were talking about the effective mass you associate with the fluid element. Yes, yes, yes. Right? And this is still the same thing? Than what? Than the, uh, the quasi particle effective mass? No, no, this, this is, you can see this quantity as some kind of an average over all, uh, all neutrons. So this is not associated with uh, just one single particle state. So let's see how you have. Do you have, you have cells of certain size here or, or what? Well, I have a lattice with clusters so lattice. and free neutrons moving through. Right. So. Um, since there are so many neutrons per cell, it means that, that the band structure is incredibly complicated in the sense that yes. there are many, many Bruno Well, actually, it depends because the, here, here within, Pascal discourse within the Fermi. So here, yes, I didn't uh, say that. So here it's neutron drift, for which there are not so many free neutrons. Yes. And here is a cross bottom, where well, there, there are lots of free neutrons. Mm -hmm. So, so what here this the physical effect that gives you such a big effective mass that says that. The, the spectrum is getting very flat, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes so yes. Wh why? Well, this is, uh, uh, this is on the bridge. So uh, this is because... Uh, yeah, this but is I would thought that this on average uh, you wouldn't get very much because most of it is, is just a, an ordinary old Fermi sphere. The few places where the, the, there's a lot of mixing between different states. It's, it's, not the, it's not that the bands uh, gets flat. It's because there are lots of uh, points where it gets flat. But in between, it can be like quadratic. Uh, so you can. So the physical picture is that you have a Fermi surface, and more or less you uh, you, are, uh, you have some holes on it, and so this reduces the surface uh, the, the surface area. Of, uh, because you, usually, when one gets into these situations, one finds there are so many uh, different gaps. Uh, uh, averages out. So I'm surprised you find the well, actually I will show factors as big as 10. Well, actually there is, uh, I will show some, uh, some analogous results in cold atoms, so maybe this will be clearer to you. So, mm -hmm. uh, so let me just go to, the, to this. Oh, that's a different story. Well, no, I think it's very similar. Okay. Same definition. Okay. Uh, so well, how how many, yeah, how the, how, let, let, remind me how, how you define this mess. I define in the same way that uh, I define that is defined in cold atom section. Well, so this can is you just remind me what that is? So this maybe is maybe the others don't know. So the single <laughs> particle energies are depending on on k, the block wave vector. Yes. So uh, the, this effective. So one can calculate the second derivative of this energy with respect to k. This is a usual effective mass tensor, a typical <coughs> effective mass tensor in solid state physics. And so you have raised this quantity of, a, uh, of a all uh, free neutron states. And this gives you the, uh, this effective mass. So actually, OK, but that was really, that's really appropriate only if uh, you've got a okay, so quadratic here, here dependence. Because so M star is divided by the free neutron density divided by this quantity. And this quantity <coughs> is the average of this uh, local effective mass tensor. Yeah, because but if, if I w w were thinking about Fermi surfaces, then, then I would normally not take second derivatives. I'd take first derivatives yes, I mean, by, I mean, you can by the Fermi momentum. Yes, exactly. I mean, you can and integrate uh, by uh, you can integrate this, transform this volume yes, integral by the surface integral. Mm -hmm. In this yeah. case, I mean, it's it's exactly uh, exactly equivalent. I just wrote it in this way because usually this is a quantity that people are using in solid states. So. Yeah. 
that you can write uh, this quantity of the surface integral. <coughs> and the way to interpret the result is really that on the Fermi surface you get holes. So, uh, so that's why the, there is a very strong increase uh, in middle layers where, uh, broadly speaking, when the, uh, the neutron interparticle spacing is uh, of the order of, uh, that is of a nuclear size. Okay, so now how about uh, plasma phases? So we can calculate exactly uh, this, uh, this effective mass in uh, nuclear plastas. But here, um, so here the, 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 the effect of plastas is essentially that this effective mass becomes anisotropic. So um, in, this, in this model, uh, I show only the transverse effective mass. So for instance, for this spaghetti phase, this is the effective mass for a flow uh, perpendicular to the, to the, to the spaghetti. Because in the other direction, in this model, this is simply equals to, to the original mass. So there is no entrainment, there is no entrainment along the, uh, <coughs> the spaghetti, is just perpendicular to it. So, so the effect of pasta is that this, uh, this entrainment is anisotropic, but in this case, uh, entrainment effects are very small. So, uh, so here this is the effective mass so for this uh, spaghetti phase. For slab, for slabs is uh, almost one, and it could goes to. <coughs> could you say just a little bit about what you actually calculated for the pasta? For the pasta, I'm calculating exactly the same quantity I showed before. This uh, second derivative of uh, single particle energies, but in this case, the single particle energy. I mean, this is this is uniform in this direction. So this is the only kind of two-dimensional at least. So you have some model for that single particle energy? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm calculating the single particle energies, and then I'm averaging out the second derivatives, and this gives me this, uh, this number. And that model is? Uh, so for this, uh, for the previous slide that I showed, uh, we calculate the, the composition of the crust using uh, extended Thomas Fermi uh, up to fourth order and we are adding also uh, potential effect. This is uh, fast <coughs> approximation to r calculations. And then I'm running uh, once uh, the r equations to get the single particle energies using broad boundary conditions. So, so for this curve I showed before, this is calculated uh, in this way. Now for these other calculations, um, at the time I used uh, a different model, so it was only Thomas Fermi and uh, running also once uh, um, single particle equations to get the single particle left. So it was a different model for this green spot and uh, the other curve I showed before. Now uh, for the bubbles, uh, uh, so you can see here for the bubbles and trainments are vanishingly small, except for this case, um, uh, well, you have to look also on this here. But for for this uh, for these spherical bubbles, then uh, there is some kind of jump, but this is uh, this is pro this is probably just due to the specific configurations. And in reality, we expect uh, some smooth transition between all these uh, these various uh, phases. So now I'm, I'm coming to to your questions uh, before. So <coughs> there are some similar entrainment effects in also in cold atoms, and <coughs> here is uh, recent calculations uh, from uh, Gentaro. Uh, about this uh, effective mass. This is exactly using the same definition that I'm using uh, <coughs> for unitary Fermi gas. So this is for 1D, just a one-dimensional lattice. So this is the Fermi energy. So this is, broadly speaking, this is the density. So this is with increasing density compared to lattice spacing, more or less. Uh, and so one can see again that there is some, uh, the general feature is the same. So there is some kind of maximum uh, when uh, the interparticle spacing is of the order of the lattice spacing. So, <coughs> and these different curves uh, correspond simply to different um, lattice potential. So lattice potential is stronger, is, uh, is stronger here and weaker here. So when one increases uh, the depth of the optical potential, then one gets uh, larger uh, effective mass. So I think there's some interesting analogy and maybe uh, one could think about some experimental uh, measurements of this effective mass uh, in the case of uh, neutron star crust. And I mean, at least for low densities, we know that neutron matter uh, could be 
millimeter uh, <coughs> Fermi gas, so maybe there's some, uh, some interesting connection here. The effective mass here is big because the, the atoms are essentially trapped in, in very deep wells uh, and, and have to say half no, between no. them. No, 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 no. This is because of this density, the scattering. It's better to think in terms of scattering. So the, the Bragg scattering in this case is more efficient uh, in this case. Now, uh, some, uh, a few slides about uh, uh, some possible <coughs> observational signatures of this thing. Uh, um, first, about, uh, about glitches. So if we believe this, that glitches are due to some transfer of angular momentum between, let's say, some uh, superfluid component, so usually this is free neutrons in the crust, and, uh, and some uh, charged particle of the component, then one can relate some observational quantities to these uh, untreatment parameters. So within this, uh, this uh, two-component model, uh, putting in uh, untreatment effects, what does change is that there is actually a coupling, uh, a coupling here. So the angular momentum for, the, for neutrons is not simply proportional to the angular velocity of the neutrons, but also to the angular velocity uh, of the other component, and also the same for this. So now we can uh, relate this, all these coefficients uh, <coughs> using simple, the, assuming simply that glitches are due to the transfer of angular momentum. So we can relate uh, this, uh, these coefficients to some observed quantities. So uh, this is just uh, the sum of all glitches. This is the inch of glitch time. Uh, and this is uh, just uh, the glitch size. Now. <coughs> So, so this ratio has to be larger than this thing. So now this quantity uh, has been estimated for some results. This is from Bennett's paper. <coughs> and, and the problem is that actually if, uh, if this is a cross superfluid which is involved in the glitch mechanism, then uh, this ratio should be actually smaller uh, than this one. Uh, and broadly speaking, this is by a factor of a few or to a factor of 10, let's say. Uh, so uh, if this so this quantity is typically of the order of a few percent, so if one finds uh, uh, some uh, very active uh, pulsars, glitching pulsars, uh, it might be difficult to, to explain uh, with just a crust uh, superfluid because due to this entrainment effect, uh, one has to consider not this ratio but this one, which is reduced by a factor of ten. So uh, so so I think this is. Uh, this is interesting, uh, interesting result. Uh, and of course, <coughs> uh, entrainment <coughs> can also be important for oscillations. Uh, so we've heard last week about QPOs in, uh, in SGOs. And so uh, there were recent papers by uh, Lars and Niels about uh, the effect of superfluid neutrons. And <coughs> uh, entrainment is uh, likely to play, uh, to play a role in the, in Calculating the frequencies, uh, the frequencies uh, of these modes. So, in summary, I think the the most important to remember from this talk is that actually, uh, when you hear about superfluidity, usually one hear only about pairing gaps. But one should really also uh, not forget uh, uh, about entrainment because there might be some uh, important effects uh, for Alex, like as I said, glitches, QPOs, uh, and so on. So, I think this is the most important. Thing from my talk. So thanks for attention. Your, the, the, when you were talking about glitches just before, I, I uh, perhaps missed it. The entrainment is entirely in the inner crust, right? Yes, yes. But I mean, this yeah. is completely general. Yeah. If you believe that yeah. it's two components, sure. Order. Did we, um, we discussed last week a mechanism by which the angular momentum requirements of glitches might become easier to satisfy by a factor of about 10. And that's if you basically uh, pin the, the uh, neutron vortices at the core against the flux tubes. So that when you spin up the crust, you're really just spinning up the crust instead of the whole star. Mm. That would help you, right? Uh, well, yes, in yeah, this case. Yeah. But then it, yeah. uh, the question is, what is the entrainment uh, between vortices and uh, so? Yeah. It's, it's, 
it's I don't know if it's not clear. Actually, uh, I, I thought a little bit about this after. Sorry, but, um, if you do that, if you bring the core into action, right? Mm. Then your rest <coughs> reservoir is much bigger. In fact, it's a bit too big. Mm. Uh, so you would you could in principle produce much bigger batches, mm. but you don't. So a question I have there that we might want to think about is. Suppose I took two rich events in the same in the same star, and they look the same. Doesn't that point towards a complete relaxation of one reservoir, rather than sort of partial relaxation of a bigger one? In, in that, in, if there's a partial thing, I can't see that the events would be very, you know, net, or should be very similar. They could have a variation. But there are systems where the glitches look very similar, one after another. Right? Well, they. In radio pulsars, they all, to a first approximation, all look like steps. Uh, no, but the relaxation part after. But the relaxation part is a tiny fraction of the glitch, typically in radio pulsars. Mm -hmm. An exception are some of the glitches in Vela, but oh, the, to a first approximation, they're steps in radio pulsars. Very little relaxation, maybe 10%. I'll, I'll show you some pictures later. Okay. The largest glitch you ever see suggest the, the, the magnitude of, of the angular momentum as well? Okay. It um, relevates to this question. If you have one re active region relaxing, or are we using up different parts of the star at different times? I think probably the best thing we can say about that is that if you have certain crossed models, and you, you might be able to put constraints on the cross super saying it can or it cannot be mm. across super <coughs> I think if you bring the core into action, then not only is it possible to explain pretty much anything, but the, our ignorance in the modeling is it's quite severe. So. I'd like to understand uh, the single particle energies that you <coughs> So you have some periodic potential and you solve the yes. uh, Hyperbolic equations in that periodic potential. Yes. So, so the large effective mass that you see here mm -hmm. should also, I mean, that's the interpretation, should also go back and affect the gap equation. Uh, yes. uh, can I interpret this uh, as uh, a big modification of the density of states because of this periodic boundary condition? Uh, the mm -hmm. no, 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 no. So where is this big effect coming from because of this periodic state? Oh, well, <coughs> it's, it's not, actually if you, if I calculate the, the density of state, the effect is, uh, is very small. So the density of state is essentially the same like for, uh, uh, like for a uniform uh, mm -hmm. neutron gas. <coughs> so the difference is uh, what matters in this case for this effective mass uh, is not just the density of states, but also uh, the curvature of, of each band. While in, when you are looking for static properties, uh, what matters is not the bending of, of the bands, but just the counting the number of bands in a given energy range. So, so here what makes really the difference is how these uh, yes. bands are curved, not just... Yes. So that's why it's not averaging out as, you know... Yes, it's not so, that's why it's not so... So, um, so the density of state is, is actually very close to the neutron gas. Mm -hmm. Thanks to everybody who spoke this morning. And uh, I'll remind you that uh, come well prepared for the mutual insulting session at uh, 4 o'clock. And today, let's not just pick on Bennett, okay? Let's not pick on Bennett. <laughs>